you know, my comfort zone was very fragile anyway. And it was changing because my vision was decreasing. So it was hard even finding a comfort zone at certain points. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have to deal with being a kid and being a teenager and all the social things that go with that. Plus you're different. And so settling in that comfort zone is really the worst thing anybody can do at that time. Certainly for me, um, because like I said, it, it, it threw my life off by two years. A man, Jim Hardy, said you were a five star. And anytime Jim hands out five stars, um, I pay attention to what's going on. So, um, Mr. Mr. Craig, I'm glad to have you on Real Talk with T. I appreciate you having me, T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a pretty unique story, man. Um, and, you know, I'm all about uh, persistence and getting after it and uh, for you to overcome the things you've overcome. Um, I really appreciate you coming in and, and sitting down and sharing. Hey, man, I'm just glad somebody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I pulled up some YouTube stuff uh, last night off that album, and um, that's pretty strong. Well, thank good, you. Good stuff. Thank you. I can't wait till everybody can hear the new stuff, man. It's, it's, I feel like we're, we're a work in progress, but I think we've really taken, you know, uh, another step in the, in the right direction with this one. Right. Well, what's the uh, – so your condition, <clears throat> I, I guess we can just launch from there. You got a ret, um Go ahead. Boy, between you and him, <laughs> we, y'all, y'all are going to wind up saying a cuss word just trying to say it. So it. It's uh, the, the aggressive disease. Yeah, he said it was aggressive. So it's yeah. retinitis pigmentosa, which uh, if you can't pronounce it, you could just say RP. RP. Um, yeah. I actually thought it was rare because it was told to me as being rare uh, when I when I first discovered I had it, um, mm-hmm. every, dang near everybody I know that's blind has RP, y'all. <laughs> not everybody. Don't don't go up to somebody that can't see and be like, you got RP because they probably they, they might not. <laughs> but like I work with a ton of people that have it. I have friends that have it. Like I know so many people that have RP. It's not as rare as I once thought. But anyway, it's a uh, it's a progressive eye disease, not an aggressive <laughs> eye disease. Gotcha. Uh, of course, in my case, it actually was aggressive because I lost my sight about twenty five years before I should have. But uh, I tell people uh, about the time I was three or four, I had the best visual acuity of my entire life. I was right on the cusp of being allowed to drive had I been sixteen at the time. <laughs> <laughs> my my vision was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was twenty four hundred, and. Uh, that's right at the edge of being able to drive with these things they call bioptic lenses. They look like even bigger than Coke bottle glasses that mm. you wear. Uh, I've actually ridden in the car with a guy that had them on. He got in a wreck. That's uh, a funny story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> on my side. but uh, And a deaf guy hit him, literally not even trying to be funny. <laughs> deaf guy hit him. And, uh, so uh, what what happens with this eye condition is you get blurry spots uh, within your central fields uh, that's pretty much the first thing that starts out. Um, some people even develop cataracts even uh, at a young age uh, and have to have those removed. And that can somewhat restore some vision that they had lost, uh, although it's not entirely typical. Then, uh, then what happens is you develop night blindness and you also lose your peripheral vision. So uh, like I was showing Jim, uh, I can roll my eyes to the right, to the left, and all I can see is like where my finger is. I can somewhat see it if I wiggle it. But that I don't even know if that's even considered peripheral vision. You know? <laughs> like, right. That, that's that's right. how bad it is. Um, also, depth perception um, is, is – uh, like a fleeting thing. Um, I play, I still play basketball, like not competitively, obviously, but I, I'm big into outdoors and stuff. Right. Yeah. It'd be a joke if I, play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like uh, just standing on the end of the court by myself, like where did I go? I thought I made it. <laughs> but so I play, I, you know, I play in the, in the driveway and uh, I can see the ball. I can see, uh, I use the, um, the pole on the, on the basketball goal. Cause it's black. Um, mm-hmm. I use it as my contrast, especially like when the sun's real bright, that's my contrast. And I use the gleam of the sun off the backboard. Those are, those are what I key in on mm-hmm. to shoot. And uh, I use a black ball and I can see it in times, 
when I shoot. Like when it comes out of my hand, I'm locked in on it. But what happens sometimes, as you know, if you've ever seen anybody play basketball, is it can roll around the rim. And a lot of times what happens is it will roll around the rim. And the last time I'll see it will be when it's over here. And then before you know it, it's bam. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, that, that, can, that can mess me up. I've chased a lot of balls into the street uh, lately. Because it's just, <laughs> you don't see it until it's too late. And you jump to the left, and it went to the right. And by the time you figure that out, you're going, you're going to run out in front of the mailman. Right. Um, but, yeah, that, uh, that for the most part, that's the gist of it. Like I said, it generally doesn't affect people until they're middle age. Usually 40 and up is when they start, when their vision falls off that cliff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just wasn't that lucky. Mine fell off a cliff when I was about 14. And like I said, I didn't start with 2020 to begin with. Mm-hmm. Got you. So it's like looking, I mean, is it like looking through, like you can see uh, holes or it's just, just these blurred brightness and dark contrast? Yeah, a lot of people um, use the, the term tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. And uh, like my dad's always said, looking through a straw. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that's pretty accurate. Um, at the point that I'm at now, there's, there's so many like intricacies with this condition. Like there's so many things that you lose over time. Like, for me, I can't identify people anymore. Like, I can generally tell, mm. um, I guess you could say, like, skin tone, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I can differentiate between that. But as far as, like, identifying faces, I don't have the ability to do that. Um, I don't have the ability at times, depending on the lighting, to differentiate between a bush and a car. <laughs> so, mm. um I, I disagree. A lot of people like to say I see shapes. I don't see shapes, like, to me, like, right. the way that I describe it. Like, I can see that this is a table and not a square. I can see the microphone in front of me because it's massive. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a cartoon bumblebee or something. Like, I don't, I'm running out of adjectives for it. It's right. <laughs> but... If I just came and said, if you were, if you just brought me in here and sat me down and didn't introduce me to the microphone, mm-hmm. uh, like Tiffany did, mm-hmm. then I, I more than likely I'd probably just bump my face on it and then I'd be like, oh, and then I'd be like, this is a microphone, and then yeah. I would start to understand the shape of it and all that. You know what I mean? Right, right. Man, that's that's amazing. So when you pick it, you said you picked up the guitar at eleven. Yes, I started taking lessons at my school uh, at the time. Uh, I took lessons at my school for three years. So I've been playing for about 15 now, and I've had what I would consider eight years of uh, formal lessons, and then the rest I've just been winging it. Yeah, what prompted? I mean, what prompted that? Why did you, like, you were made to do it, or you li- or you're like, hey, I'm going to be a rock star? Or well, I would, how, I would you... like to think I was made for it, because that would make me feel like the last 15 years haven't been <laughs> just me goofing off from not doing yeah. my homework. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, did somebody make you do it? Oh, I was never made to do it. Um, you just wanted to do it. From the time I was, like, in preschool, you know, when my parents would take me to school, we'd listen to the radio, and mm-hmm. I was a huge country fan growing up, um, and, and I, uh, I think the first song I ever memorized all the lyrics to – was I'm from the country by Tracy Bird. (laughs) And everybody's always just, like, been in awe that I can remember lyrics, uh, which I don't feel like is impressive. But, I mean, I feel like things that other people do are impressive. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've I've been doing that literally, like I said, since preschool. And then I I used to, you know, be a huge fanboy of Toby Keith. And I got to meet him when I was, like, five when he came to the Peanut Festival. Mm-hmm. And he signed a ukulele, and he ripped my dad's Auburn hat off and signed it. And my dad still to this day was like, I just wish he hadn't done that to my new hat. <laughs> 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 like his autograph is yeah, nothing. I'm <laughs> a fan, but uh, yeah. leave my hat alone. But, dude, it's my hat. Yeah, <laughs> I have the same attitude. I, I love my hats. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's kind of the backstory. was country music is what really got me started. And, uh it took me about three years playing guitar, so I was, I think, eighth grade before I was able to play and sing at the same time. It is, it is very, very difficult to do. Yeah. So as you're, you're practicing at at eleven. Yes. And your vision is steadily getting worse, or did it like really came on and decreased rapidly, or were you already 
Black, yeah, uh, from from what I can remember around that age. Yeah. See, like I was reading, I was reading music at that age. Um, I, I touched on it uh, with Jim. I use a, a I used a CCTV, it's a closed circuit television, mm-hmm. and basically what it is, it's like a computer monitor. You put a piece of paper under it, and it blows the document up that you're reading, and you're able to actually slide the tray that it's on like left and right and read it, um, just like anybody else would. And so. Um, I was putting the books that we had on that and I would have like an aide come and move the tray for me while we were actually having class back and forth and I would read the notes. So I actually learned how to play guitar the the classical way, I guess you could say, like yeah. reading reading sheet music and learning that way. And then as my vision fell off a cliff, which I would probably say more of eighth and ninth grade than than sixth and seventh, um, that's when I transitioned to, well, I can't do this anymore. So I had to start learning by ear. <clears throat> right. So that's 14 or 15 years old. Yes. Bam. Like your vision falls off. Yes. And then you start going by ear. What yeah. I mean, do you think? So you had already fell in love basically with playing and man, you were invested in it big time. If you've been doing it for three years. Yeah. My, my first gig, I guess you could call it a gig was when I was 14. I played at a, this place called country crossing in Dothan. Mm-hmm. Um, at the amphitheater. I can't even remember what it was for. There was some sort of something happening out there. Um, and I played, uh, I'd like wow. to think there was 40 people out there. <laughs> I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not the best guesser of counting people, right. but there was a pretty decent crowd out there. And yeah. I, I think I played like five or six songs. And, cool. uh, that was, that, that was, that was it for me. 14 years old. I was like, well, I'm a uh, Toby Keith. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, all right. So as your vision falls off, and you still have your guitar. I mean, you does it just push you into that? Are you like cleaving to that? Is that is that all you're thinking about, or is that already all you were thinking about? Yeah, like honestly, in a roundabout way, um, instead of doing what I should have been doing and uh, holding myself more accountable, I guess like academically and real world mm-hmm. sense, um, I just kind of sank into my music. So instead of uh, learning about technology and learning how to take care of myself as I aged, I just <clears throat> sat in my room and listened to records, and I could play, you know, the albums of my favorite artists forwards and backwards. And uh, man, I probably did that. I probably did that for five or six years, and and that was like all I was. And that's why now, when I go out and play, mm-hmm. half the songs that I know how to play was when I learned them back then, and I've been playing them for over ten years. Wow. Wow. How, okay. All right. Well, how did um, uh, what mentally, what is that like? Can you re, can you rewind back to there and go, how, what what are you thinking? Like, how does that how how do you press through and go? Okay, um, or was that just your only refuge? And I'm gonna I'm gonna sink myself into that. Yeah, I don't think like consciously I realized what I was doing back then. But then when you look back, it's like, well, you didn't really have a life, you know, because I mean, mm-hmm. I had friends and all that, so I, like I would go do things, um, and of course, you know, my family is awesome, so you know we would do things together. But as far as like day to day, like obviously, I didn't play sports competitively. Um, I didn't, like I say, I didn't hold myself accountable academically. So yeah, I mean, there was just so much free time where I would come home, and I would shut my door, and I would just play guitar until it got to the point to where I couldn't physically play it anymore. And like I said, I mean, I just did that. I <laughs> you did couldn't that. physically play it anymore. Oh yeah, like I like my hands would get to the point to where they were sore, and I had to stop. Wow. Either that, or like somebody would come bang on the door, and they were like, "Dude, like <laughs> I, my head is so, it's just killing me. Please, right? Please stop." <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. We'll transition out of there. What? Move on. How'd you get? How'd you get to Auburn, man? War Eagle. Yeah, War Eagle. Um, so. Like I said, uh, I got a late start um, to adulthood, I guess. I graduated high school on time and all, and all that. But uh, because I didn't uh, make it a priority to learn assistive technology for me so that I could be on the same level as my mm-hmm. peers, um, I didn't have any skills. If I couldn't go to college because college, there's different rules in college than there are in high school. So, like, in high school, you can literally have somebody sit there and take your notes and read your tests and do all that for you. Well, in college, they don't provide that as an accommodation. 
They will provide you a note taker. Nine times out of ten, your note taker is a student, not a staff member of the school, though. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So your notes are going to come from somebody that, you know, is on your level, and they may not take great notes. And I, I've dealt with that before. Or sometimes they may not take notes the way you do. So they may have five pages of notes, and you may have only took one if you'd have had the ability. <laughs> um, if you get lucky, which I did in some of my classes, uh, you can just get the teacher's notes, which is – that's the ticket. That, that's your A. If you get teacher's notes and you get a B, like, you need to chill. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do way more than you're doing. Um, but, yeah. but, yeah, so um, – the, the accommodation process is just totally different. And you're more accountable in college than you are in high school. And so, mm -hmm. like I said, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't even I didn't know that was even a thing. So I worked. I did like a sheltered workshop for probably like a year off and on. Uh, they actually fired me for being too good at my job. I joke about that all the time. <laughs> um, what? Yeah. It, it, well, it's a long story. I'll make it short. So um, – a lot of times, if you have a disability, you'll have what's called a rehab counselor, a vocational rehab counselor. Mm -hmm. They provide a service that's like a summer work program when you're in high school. You can work. But the problem with this is a lot of times you're going to work a job that's like very tedious or something that you probably wouldn't normally do. You know, like for me, by the time I did this, it wasn't the summer work program. It was the sheltered workshop. This is different. This is not for kids. This is for adults. It's okay. basically a test. It's not a real job, so to speak. It's a test to see that you can show up to work every day. You can do what your supervisor mm -hmm. asks. You can go to the safety meetings and not be a clown like I was. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's a test, so to speak. Like Some people do do it longer than others, but essentially that's why the rehab counselors put you there because they use that as evidence to show other employers like, hey, we put Russell Craig at this place mm -hmm. for six months and he did so good, we couldn't let him work there anymore because <laughs> he was out working everybody. So, <laughs> yeah. So in saying that, he put me there. I'm 18. I have no life again and because all my friends went to college or uh, moved or did whatever adults do mm -hmm. after high school. Mm -hmm. So I have no life. I'm living with my dad at the time, working playing guitar when I get home until he goes like, I got to go to bed, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so they pull me in their office after like four months of me being there and they go, Hey man, uh, you, uh, you're ridiculously fast for this job. This isn't meant for you. Uh, we're going to let you go. Well, that was the only income I had and I had no life again. Like this was my only purpose for getting up. Right. And I was so angry because it wasn't just my supervisor. My rehab counselor was in there. And I remember me just yelling at him like a, just a savage. Yeah. And he was like, <laughs> Russell, you're not going to stay here, dude. And what he was trying to tell me is like, you can do more. You don't have to be here. Oh. We're going to help you find, you know, something that you can do that's, that's more meaningful to you. Right. Like you can, you can do more and didn't realize that at the time. So I fought it. So, you know, you're basically going to have to fast forward another six months uh, of me kind of mm -hmm. going back and forth. I got, I got, uh, actually got back on there and worked for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I quit. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't give me enough hours. <laughs> they didn't give me enough hours. I think they did that on purpose. I think they were like, we need to let him quit on his own. <laughs> so gotcha. they hired me back. They were like, we'll give you 30 hours a week. I was like, heck yeah. And, uh, they did that once. <laughs> yeah. And so I quit. Well then fast forward. So I'm at Gentry. Uh, which is the place I work now um, as a student. This is 2014. Um, mm -hmm. and I know we're dragging on. I'm trying to. No, no, <laughs> that, to that's good, man, because I, 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 I like, I mean, just keep on. So this is November of 2014, mm -hmm. and I'm there as a student. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, both sides of this equation eventually. But I'm there. I'm being evaluated as a student. Um, at Gentry. At Gentry. Okay. I'm, I'm there. First week, I don't know anybody, um, and it was kind of lonely, but I met staff there, people that worked there that were blind, that had even less vision than me even, mm. you know, and so um, that motivated me. Like, that got me through the awkwardness of being in a new place because I was like, wow, these guys got pretty good jobs, and, and they're teaching me how to do stuff, and they're, like, really good at it. 
Um, mm. They have a lot of different classes there. Like they have an independent living class, assistive technology. Like there's a lot of things they can teach you how to do, like besides academics, like real world stuff. And it blew me away. And so, right. Um, actually, uh, I'm gonna adjust these. That's good. <laughs> I got a big head. I'm sorry. So, is that, <laughs> well, is that, is that like when you said beside academics? So, is that like where, like the world cl- classes you? If you can't see, you then you go to some kind of academic field. Well, like that wasn't my problem. Like that's why I say besides academics, like I never had a problem in school. So, hmm. um, what, what my problem was, was me, like my attitude about learning how to do things. Gotcha. So like the ILS, the AT, what those do is they teach you how to do what everybody else does as far as adulthood, cooking, cleaning, um, everything that goes with managing a household, even down to budgeting, but you do it as somebody who has a vision impairment. Gotcha. And, and the same with AT. So you learn how to use a computer or a, a phone or any kind of device that's going to help you at work or school. They teach you how to use it, and they teach you how to do operations that you may have not learned in school. So how to web browse, how to search for things, and that nature. That, that to me, is what I benefited the most from while I was there. Gotcha. But, like, to, to kind of, to uh, I guess put it all together. What sold me going there was I did a tour like a month before that November. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the guy that gave me the tour, um, he was totally blind. And of course he used a cane too. And Mm -hmm. he was so good at giving the tour. Like he knew every spot of that campus, like the back of his hand. And he would turn like, like somebody with vision, like he did visual things, like somebody that had vision would turn and be like, and this is the library and be like dead in the middle of the doorway. And you're like, there's just no, this guy's full of crap. And then, and then like he would take you outside and you're going, all right, well this is where he's going to maybe slow his gait down. So he doesn't like trip. No, he's running like full throttle through the breezeway, showing me the dorm, showing me the gym, showing me this, showing me that. And, and knows people like we'll get somewhere and, He'll just like know they're there, and they're like, and here's so and so, and they're this teacher. And well, what's, like, how does he do that? I mean, I don't know now, and I work <laughs> right next to him. And you work right next to him I now. Do. We work one office apart. And wow, he he's perfect for tours. Like he sells everybody, not just me, but yeah. he sold me on going there because I was like, oh, this is amazing. This guy turned into a sorcerer, and I want to do that. Um, and that that's what's <laughs> that's what sold me being there. And uh, he, he's dang good at his job. Yeah. Um, he kept me there. I was there from November 2014 to May of 2016. My my last semester there, so January through May, yeah. I went to uh, Central Alabama Community College in Talladega through yeah. what they call their college prep dual enrollment program with Gentry. So I stayed at Gentry just like I had been, mm-hmm. and they provided transportation for me to the college. And they also, like, opened up their doors, like, in their academics room and all that. So I had academic tutoring and all that while I was there. Very this cool. Was, this was my first semester of college, mind you, and I'm 21, which that's not the biggest deal. Like, I've heard a lot of people be like, well, I'm 35, and I just went to college. <laughs> right. But still, like, for me, you got to put it in context for me. Like like I said, most of my friends had already been to college, or just about to get out of college and things like that. They, they had yeah. already been living their lives. So for me – I'm 21. I'm I I consider myself about two years behind everybody at this point. Mm-hmm. All right, and I don't believe in myself still. I I got the skills that I've been saying I was lacking, mm-hmm. and so I'm running out of excuses. Mm. Right, but I still don't really believe in myself. So I go and I sit through my classes. At the end of the semester, I have all A's. I've never made all A's. <laughs> like Bang. I've always been good at school, but like I said, like I just didn't take a, account like ownership of it. Yeah. So like A's and B's were good enough for me. Like right. my, my parents didn't ride me if I got A's and B's. So that was like my threshold. I was like, all right, I can get a B. It's cool. Yeah. So you can coast a B. Yeah. Like you, easy. Yeah. Easy. Gotcha. And and so all A's was like eye opening. And then we had what's called a program review. They do these with all the students. Mm-hmm. They do them periodically. You get them, I think, every six weeks or so. And they just talk about the progress you made in your classes. Well, eventually, like you do so much that they end your program. So in May, they met with me. 
And they were like, wow, Russell, you know, two years ago, you just wanted to go to work. You didn't even want to go to school. And, you know, you've come so far, your attitude has changed. And, you mm -hmm. know, we think you're ready to go. And at the time I was like, no, because <laughs> like I'd done so much in, uh, you know, roughly two years. Right. I didn't want to leave. And yeah. I was like, I'm finally stable. And I finally almost believe in myself. Yeah. And they were like, well, we're cutting the cord. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I wound up from there going to CAC on my own, not, not, you know, associated with them. I go to CAC, I get my associate's degree. Um, and I kid a 4.0 the whole time I was on the president's list every semester. Wow. And it, it was amazing. And I got to give the commencement speech at the, uh, graduation for CACC back in 2018. And I, I just was like tickled to death that they even asked me to do it. I was like, how do y'all even know I'm a good speaker? Like <laughs> I just, I just know math and biology. <clears throat> right. That was so much fun to be able to do that. And that, that's what got me to, to Auburn. I started Auburn in, in uh, the fall of 2018, which is a different can of worms, man. You want to talk about nervous, like that's another level of, of being terrified. Yeah. Why get in? Why, why, fa why go toward terrified? Like, you know what I'm saying? That's a big, that's a huge step. What made you do that? What made you go from commencement speech to say, hey, I'm going this, here I'm going? Well, so there was a big like turn of events that happened, I guess, like with my, with my mindset, so to speak, because I've always loved music. I always wanted to do music. So while I was still at Gentry, I was working with the college prep teacher on looking at schools. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, I want, like I said, want to do music. So I looked at a bunch of different degrees dealing with music, sound engineering, music theory, music teaching, just mm -hmm. anything to do with music, going down the catalog, seeing what the required classes were. And uh, so we went to this school. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't, I don't want to like put anybody down or embarrass anyone. But we, uh, we went to this school that I really wanted to go to at the time mm -hmm. and uh, met with their teachers in the music department. And they were cool. No problem with that at all. Okay, but I went to meet with the people that were over the accommodations. Like, it's, it's basically the disability services uh, office. Right. I went to go meet with them. And uh, really, the only concern I had was about transportation because a lot of the music stuff was off campus. And mm. there was a major highway, like, right when you step out the door. There was no parking lot. And uh, right. I was like, you know, hey, can we get, you know, a bus or like a van or just somebody to drop me off there? And they just flat out said, no, we don't do that. You got to provide your own transportation. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to die. Like, <laughs> like I've, I've physically. <laughs> I'm going to die. Yeah, I have the ability to cross the street and all that. But like, this is a legit four lane highway. Right. This is a no, no. Yeah. And. And, and, and they just flat out said no? Yeah, and, and, and then when I kind of grilled them about it and started asking about other things that I had questions about, mm -hmm. they were like, man, it's like almost lunchtime. Like, it's kind of the attitude that I got from them. They're like, mm -hmm. whatever, man. Like, they didn't care that I was there. They didn't need my money is mm -hmm. the way that I took it. Mm -hmm. And so I leave from there. I tell the teacher when we get back to school, I'm like, <laughs> okay, so obviously that place isn't for me. And uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do then. And they, like I said, in May, they told me I was on my own at Gentry, right? Because this mm -hmm. is when I'm still at Gentry. Mm -hmm. Well, I go to CAC in the fall of 2016. And just over the one weekend, as I'm watching college football, and uh, you get you get epiphanies when you watch college football, y'all. So, like, <laughs> like, let your husbands watch it. They'll, they'll learn things, okay? I'm literally watching football, and I just had an epiphany. And I had, like, this wave come over me. And I don't know how to explain it because it's really not happened since then. It was like just something took a hold of me and was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna help you. I'm going to show you what you need to do. And I didn't even know this existed. Like, I can't make it up. I, uh, I was like, you know what? I don't want to do music anymore. I can play music now. I don't need any help doing what I'm doing now. I want to get a degree in something related to rehabilitation. Because, I've, like I said, I've had a rehab counselor since I was 16. Right. And uh, I know that side of it. I didn't know if I necessarily wanted to be a rehab counselor, but I was like, I'm kind of wasting my time going to school to do something I'm already doing, you know? Mm. Like, I didn't want to work in the music industry. I just want to play music. Gotcha. So why am I wasting my time when I could still do that? Let's let's shift focus, okay? Right. And I did. Like, 
I don't even, like I said, I could not put into words. It was like the Holy Spirit came over me and was like, I'm going to show you what to do now. That's where Auburn comes into play. So that, like that, you're watching college football. Yeah. <laughs> God shows up. Yes. Like he does. And, and now immediately you, you change majors. You have a whole new different route. You're good fixing to go. Yes. And, and, and so mm. the, like I said, I'm still at CAC. I, I didn't change plans of, I was always going to get my associates. Mm -hmm. Okay. But where Auburn comes into play is Auburn at that time is the only school in the state that has this degree. It's a rehab and disability studies degree. Okay. I, I know people that have it. It just never dawned on me that I could benefit from it. You know, it never even stuck in my head that they had the degree, but it's like, once this came over me, I was like, Oh, I could go do that. And then I could go, do other things. I could go get a master's. Oh, and I could go to Auburn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and let's well, see my my dad, um, his sister and her husband, they all graduated uh from Auburn. Mm -hmm. So aunt, uncle, dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was a diehard Alabama fan growing up. Um, and my grandpa is a diehard Alabama fan. Mm -hmm. And of course, once my dad went to Auburn, like that all it went out the window. Changes all that. Yeah, yeah. 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 which it should. That's what happened but, to uh, me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so. I always wanted to go to Auburn, but I was always, like, terrified to yeah. go to Auburn. Because, yeah. like I said, you know, growing up, didn't believe in myself, didn't have the skills. It's not until this point, you know, 2016 fall, that I even thought I had a prayer of going. And so when you fast forward to the summer of 2018 when I'm about to go, like, that's where all the butterflies hit because it's like, all right, you had that epiphany and mm -hmm. you worked towards this. And it's here now, and you got to navigate this huge campus and yeah. take these classes, and you got to tackle this giant because you know it looks like a giant, you know, before you get into it. Right. So you're laying in bed the the night before you go in your first classes, or has this been a big ramp up thing, or you just is it? What's that like? Like, what's your what's your mindset? How do you turn? How do you get in? You know, to face that thing? Is it just hey, God? Basically showed up and said, "Hey, I'm fixing to I'm fixing to show you which way to go if you'll just if you'll just if you'll just follow." Well, it's always important to to pray and and to tr and to trust God. Um, that that should be first and foremost. Even if I don't always you know do that myself, but that that is what we're supposed to do in, mm -hmm. in my in my opinion. That's my belief. Yeah, we um, share that. Right. Um, but so I, I also believe in preparation. Okay, I don't think you should always just jump into stuff without knowing what you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. I have, and it never works. <laughs> so, um, you know, hence that other school. Yeah. So, luckily, I didn't register for class or anything like that. But right. so, so what happened is, like, since my dad had gone to the school, he was familiar with the with the building that I was going to be taking the majority of my classes with. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a huge building. People that can see get lost in it all the time. And I laugh at them because I think it's easy to navigate, and I'll explain. But so, so what we did is he took me there uh, in the summer, like early summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I showed him, you know, the room numbers and all, and he goes, all right. And he just walked me around the building. And uh, he taught me, like, what I would consider shortcuts because they were ways off the beaten path. May have not necessarily been shorter distances, but he was trying to get me out of traffic because he knew that would intimidate me. Yeah. So um, I learned how to get to all my classes. And once I learned those, like, I was good because I knew where everything else was. I could find the, you know, for the rest of the semesters I was going to be there, I was going to be good because right. I knew where everything was. Um, that took some of the butterflies away. But... Um, I rode public transit to get there. Um, I live with my mom while I was at Auburn because she lives in Auburn. So I was just staying with her. And uh, I had uh, Lee Russell Public Transit pick me up from her house, and they dropped me off like maybe 50, 100 yards from uh, the Haley Center, which is where my classes were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, another story is people used to pick on me. How come you get to be up there? And we had to get dropped off with Tiger Transit all the way. I'm like, I don't know. You, you suck. I don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm, be I'm better than you. I you want to, do you want to trade places with me? And I will gladly walk 200 extra yards. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, so, right on. Uh, but anyway, so I get on the bus. This is my first day at Auburn. And, uh, whoo, <laughs> like, it's just, it's so nerve wracking. Cause I know where to go. 
But yeah. what I'm scared of is it's going to be like when I was really young and I was in school and people are going to come at me and they're not going to know anything about me. Like, cause mm-hmm. most people, um, like a lot of people don't know blindness. They don't see people that are blind on a daily basis. Right. So they see a guy walking out with a stick. Some people may get afraid. Some people might not even see me cause they're on their stupid phones. Like <laughs> there's so many different things that could be going on yeah. and it makes me so nervous. I don't like crowds. Even now I still just don't like crowds. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm going, all right, my main hurdle is to get off, go through this concourse. And once I get in the building, I'm going to, I'm going to feel like I can breathe a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. So I get off the bus, I go through the concourse, like probably blue in the face by the time I get to the door. Cause I'm just holding my, (laughs) I'm just waiting. I'm basically waiting on someone to run into me and start a confrontation, you know? Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) what I, what the, what the biggest hurdle is though, is not the concourse. It's when you get to those doors. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to the Haley center, but like, uh, when you go to the side, there's several doors side by side each other. Yeah. And that, yeah. I call that like, like the herd yeah. <laughs> center, because like, as soon as, as soon as you get ready to go in, all the doors fling open and hundreds of people file yes. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have to get through that. That was nerve wracking the first week. Cause i mm-hmm. I can sometimes be socially awkward and sometimes like, I, I mean, I can't see things. So sometimes somebody will hold the door open. I won't even know they're doing it. And so by the time I walk through it, I won't even know to be like, thank you. Or sometimes they won't even hold it open. Sometimes they're jerks. They fling it open, walk past me somehow without me bumping into them. And I walk through it right before it closes and I go, thank you. And no one's there. And I I feel just as awkward both times. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That, that first week was tough, but honestly, like if anybody's out there and they have to go through change or anything like that or Mm -hmm. something they feel like is a big mountain to climb, Mm -hmm. Honestly, like that first week was it. Like even by week two, like no exaggeration, it was just like I was home. I, I met a couple of couple of friends. Uh, my first week there, people I'd never met. I'm sitting on a bench eating Cheez Its and zebra cakes for lunch because <laughs> I'm too intimidated to go in the student center and fight through the crowd to get lunch. Yeah. So I'm, which is on me. I should have been better prepared for that, but you know, neither here nor there, I'm sitting on a concrete bench eating Cheez-Its and zebra cakes. And, uh, some people walk up and they go like, Hey man, like you, you don't have lunch plans. eh?" and I was like, nah, I just don't, I don't know about going in the student center yet. And they were like, I'll take you, let's go. And, and from then on, like I always had friends there, uh, you know, and I, 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 it was just a fan. It's a fantastic experience. I mean, everybody needs to experience it in my Mm -hmm. opinion. And I, I, I'm so thankful that, Whatever was in me that drove me to do that got me over the edge because, I mean, it's just been it's just been one one awesome experience after another since then. Right? Did you? All right. So, you're running through college, but you're also playing that music. Yeah, and it's advancing like each year. Like mm-hmm. it, you know, while I'm in college, I'm also like getting getting better. Like obviously playing and singing, and and not only that, like I'm somewhat growing in popularity. So I'm getting more and more gigs right and, uh, right and i'm having to fight that though like i'm having to stay focused and and be like look you know you asked for this do your schoolwork. Mm. don't book so many gigs that you are beaten down on the weekends yeah and and you can't rest because you have to rest i mean college is stressful life is stressful you yeah. know um man that's even now that's still like a, a process that i have to be mindful of like don't overbook like you know take time to heal and and to rest and and all that so yeah that that was that was one thing i always had to fight when i was at auburn is don't don't overdo it man well it'd be easy to be the life of the party like hey come over and hang out and you know yeah. play and sing and well, when, and when you have a guitar, man, like everybody wants to be your friend. When Absolutely. They see the guitar. Like, oh, you come over here. Come do this. Oh, we'll give you beer, we'll give you food, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. Well, see, like I said, I started college late. I was over all that. I did all my partying before I got to college. So I didn't care about being the life of the party. Yep. If you had money, I would come see you. Um, <laughs> and I don't play guitar just for money. I play it for the enjoyment. But I'm yeah. just saying, like, I'm not going to everybody's frat party and this and that yeah. just for beer and, and to look at girls and all that don't benefit me right. one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Well, man, that's, that's, uh, that's cool. Um, so you, your, um, your mindset on that is just taking the next thing, whatever's 
presented in front of you and you just keep moving? Oh, I'm just a totally different person today than I was even five years ago, and certainly 10 and 15 years ago. Um, you know, now uh, I'm sure there are times where I, I may run away from change or times where I fight things, but, like, I really do embrace challenges and uh, I, I love my job, and I love playing music. I like to go play new places. And, uh, you know, my big thing uh, as far as recreation time is I'm always telling my family, like, let's go somewhere new. I'm tired of going to the beach. Go mm. to the beach every year. Let's not, you know, yeah. let's do new things <clears throat> because that's just how my mindset has changed now. I want to do things that I haven't done because I saw over the last four years of my life that I was able to do a whole bunch of things that people told me I couldn't do, and I told myself I couldn't do. So now it's kind of it's kind of like that runner's mentality where, like, you run a half marathon, and you're like, well, I'm going to run a full one now. It's like you get addicted to it. You're like, well, what, what else can I do that I didn't know I could do? Wow. So it, completely flip-flop. You wanted to be uh, systematic in everything back when you were young or growing up, and now you just want to do the next new thing. Yeah, because, you know, probably whether you have a disability or not, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that like the same old same. They find something that they like doing or that they're good at doing, and they stick they stick in the comfort zone. Yeah. And so for me, <clears throat> excuse me, having a disability, you know, my comfort zone was very fragile anyway, and it was changing because my vision was decreasing. So it was hard even finding a comfort zone at certain points. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to deal with being a kid and being a teenager and all the social things that go with that. Plus you're different. And so settling in that comfort zone is really the worst thing anybody can do at that time. Certainly for me. Um, yeah. cause like I said, it, it, it threw my life off by two years mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, like you're, you you hit the nail on the head there. Like now, you know, I, I, I embrace, you know, new opportunities. Whereas, you know, maybe six or seven years ago, I would have been like, uh, I don't want to go there and do that. I'm not capable or what, you know, I would have, I would have gave you some excuse yeah. and I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. So now playing gigs, you don't have a problem with crowds. Like you're just, you're just there. Yeah. That's, you get a, after. that's another thing that's changed is like my stage presence, I would say has gotten so much better as my confidence in myself has, has, um, I guess developed, Mm -hmm. Um, and like even beyond college, like now when I'm up there, it's like, it's almost like we're at a bonfire no matter how big the crowd is and I'm just playing <laughs> and it's, we're just having a good time. That's I awesome. Don't, I don't, I don't drink or anything like that. I, right. I go up there and I treat it like a job and I have a great time, but I, I give everybody a professional show. Like I wouldn't pay big money to see somebody that I idolize getting tore up. So that's the yeah. that's the mindset that I take. I go right. up there. And you go I, to work. And I do. And then yeah. when I get off stage now, I try uh, to make it a point to go talk to people, even if it's only one person, because mm -hmm. you, you never know that like that one person mm -hmm. beyond maybe booking you somewhere else, that one person, you may have just saved their life. Like it could be that deep. You could have just kept them from doing something awful. You could have you could have changed their mood even if you want to make it lighter. That's a fact. You, there's just so many things. You know, I've met people that uh, were parents of kids with disabilities. I've met people that had disabilities, people that had PTSD, just all kinds of different things. There's so many experiences out there mm -hmm. when you perform. And I'm getting better all the time. And I have a long way to go, but I'm really starting to embrace off stage as much as on stage, you know. Right. How do you said uh, the word confidence, and how did you like? Are you just building that over time? How do you how how do you how do you get to where you treat you're on a big stage like it's a campfire? You're always growing. I'm fortunate. Uh, I talk about it all the time. I just have a great support system. I mean, my family is amazing. I have very few friends, and the friends that I have are amazing. Like I don't hang around a bunch of yes men. My family and my friends mm -hmm. they keep me humble. And they tell me when I need to step my game up in certain areas. And that helps tremendously. And, and the other side of that coin wow. is there's no replacement for experience either. So you should take advice people give you. And you should also keep at it, you know. And I've done a lot of awesome things um, in my career, even, even little old me. Mm -hmm. um, I got to open for the Charlie Daniels Band in 2016 at Montgomery Performing Arts Center. Um, I had 
I don't know how many people and I don't want to say because I don't you know want to seem like bragging but I had a ton of people that were there mm -hmm. just to see me and I thought that was so awesome that they came to support me I've got it archived uh, it's on my YouTube channel my my whole performance I was actually sick that day and I didn't feel, <laughs> I didn't feel good I was in an insane amount of pain and I went out there really yeah, yeah, yeah. That was at the time I actually needed my gallbladder removed. So I was skinny. Like I was about 165 pounds and wow. I was just hurting, nauseous. And I went out there. Uh, even then I was trying to talk myself out of doing it. And that was the biggest opportunity at the time that I had. And I yeah. was just like, I can't, I can't. It's always been my thing. I can't do it. And uh, I went and did it. And then I was going to just sit in the dressing room and sulk the rest of the night after I did it. Mm -hmm. Um because being a musician, even still today, I'm a perfectionist. I'm always like, yeah, I had a great show, but, you know, there's always the but. So I'm sitting in there. I just wish I could have done that, but I was hurting. And uh, my mom was like, come out front and meet people and sell your shirts and, and, and all that, you know. And yeah, I was like, no, nah, I don't want And my mom was like, I'm coming to get you. <laughs> She's like, you're going to get up here and you're going to do that. Like all yeah. these people came to see you and even the ones that didn't, like they're going to want to meet you. And I did that in pain for probably like the rest of the show because Charlie went up there and played and the whole time he was playing I was out there like shaking people's hands signing stuff signing stuff's fun when you can't see I love doing that people just think you're ruining their day <laughs> like, they're like can you sign my ticket and you're just like <laughs> there you go and they're like oh, thanks you know <laughs> but yeah that that's that's the other side of the coin is experience I've done it so much I've bombed so many times. Really? Oh, I've played so many terrible shows, man. And I'm not saying I don't care because I care all the time. Yeah. I always yeah. care. But it doesn't, like, hurt my feelings when I bomb like it used to. Like, I don't take it personally. I just go. How uh, did you get over that when you, when you blow it to not take it personally? Well, the best, the best way to get over it in the moment yeah. is to go get back on stage. Um, it's as just, soon as possible. Yeah. Like it's just like an athlete or like anybody that does, you know, any kind of work. Like if you, if you have a bad day or, if, you know, if you're a pitcher and you have a bad outing or whatever, the best mm -hmm. thing to do is go get back on the mound. Mm -hmm. That's why you see managers a lot of times, like for bullpen guys, especially they have a bad outing. They trot them back out there the next day because they're like, you got to get that. You got to get the yips out of your head. Mm. And so, you know, performing, I don't necessarily have the luxury of going and playing five shows a week. So the shows that I do play, yeah. like I got to make them count. Um, I've had to kind of go back and forth at times in my career with taking every show seriously. Sometimes I would go through there and just go through the motions. And you can't do that when you perform, man. You got to go up there and act like that everybody wanted you to be there. Like you were put there for a reason. And even if three people pay attention and 200 try to talk over you, just yep. do your job. And yeah. one, I don't even know how long it's been since I adopted that mindset, maybe a year or two. But since I've done that, like the quality of my shows has just gone up so much in value. And I'm wow. having more fun. Like I said earlier, like it's not about the money. It's about the joy of playing music and feeling like I get to make a difference. I'm making a difference on this stage. And then if I get to meet somebody, I'm going to make a difference to them too. Man. <laughs> That's powerful, dude. Powerful stuff. Powerful Appreciate stuff. It. Man, I can't I, I can't thank you enough. I, I mean, that's probably a good way to a good route to close right there. Uh, you mind um, you know, yeah, working that pick a little bit. <laughs> yeah, what you want me to do? Us? I don't know, man. What 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 makes you feel good? <sighs> feel good. I don't know, man. Uh you know, speaking of feel good, <laughs> I uh <laughs> I have the worst time writing original music that's like real upbeat, like what you hear on the radio today. Yeah. A lot of my stuff is like deep meaning and stuff. And I've been talking to different songwriter friends that I have, like, how do y'all do it? How do y'all just go out there and go like, <laughs> cold beer and a Friday night, blue jeans? Like, I can't do it. <laughs> Cannot do it. I can't do it. All, I, 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 I joke because I wouldn't do this, but I'm, yeah. I'm always like, yeah, you know what, what my – what my ideal show is, is to go up there and make you cry in your beer for two hours and then go home. <laughs> <laughs> hit you in the heart. Yeah, just hit you in hit the feels in the one time. Man, that's pretty good. Hey, before you do that, where, where can everybody find you online? Oh, man. Uh, I got a website. It's russellcraigsounds.com. Uh, you can follow me on social media. Facebook and Instagram is Russell Craig Sounds. 
That's S O U N D S. And uh, on YouTube, if you look up Russell Craig Sounds, the first thing that pops up is my Call Me the Rain uh, music video. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Of course, all my music is uh, on all the stores everybody goes to, iTunes, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Music, all that stuff. Just look up Russell Craig for that stuff. Uh, my album is Call Me the Rain. Uh, we released two new songs last year. One's called Rain, and the other one's called I'm Over You. Put it on us. How uh, how how loud can we get here? As loud as you want to get. As loud as we want. Nobody's in the building. I'll give you a uh, I'll give you a taste of uh, of rain. How about that? There you go. They want to hold your ears. <laughs> Come on. She's got me running from myself. She brought me to this living hell. Now that I'm here, I'm all Give a damn. You cannot change the way I am. Now that you're gone, it feels like home. When she broke her heart. All the scenes were sown, all the grief and shame that broke my home. So where I stand, I will not remain. I'll bring the flowers, she brings the rain. Thank you. Thank Fantastic, you. man. That's awesome. That's a that's that campfire. That's it. Awesome. I appreciate you, Russell. Hey, appreciate you having me on, T. Thank you, buddy. (laughs) 